I had a publicity department, they couldn't do a better job to market my work than what's happening in the world. <laughs> and um, because what's at the bottom of the madness, of the collective madness that's playing out in so many different ways is Watiko. And Watiko, it's a Native American term, and it you know, connotes this, this, this mind virus. And sometimes people, they'll hear about a mind virus and they'll be triggered and thinking, wow, that's kind of crazy or new agey or woo woo or something like that. And I point out what I mean by a mind virus is that the origin and finding the cure, the solution of our collective madness is to be found within the psyche. And that's what a mind virus is. That's what I mean by the notion of a mind virus. So that, that's a no-brainer. It couldn't be more obvious that the source of our collective madness is within our own psyches, okay? And what's happening in the world is over the top. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I really study it as much as I can, trying to figure out what in the world is happening. And it's, it's really frightening from one point of view. And the thing about fear, if we get hooked by fear, that's the, that's the superfood for the mind virus, for Watiko. But it's also important for us to open our eyes because the thing about Watiko, Watiko, I'll just take a step back. When I was a little kid, I was thinking about this the other day. There was a certain, I think we all go through phases where we want to be like president or a ball player or like whatever. And I wanted to be an eye doctor and um, to help heal people who couldn't see. And it's interesting because Watiko is a form of blindness. And, but it's a peculiar form of blindness. And here I am, now I've cast myself in this role of creating this body of work that's really trying to heal the blindness. But it's a peculiar form of blindness, this Swatiko mind virus, because it thinks it's sighted. It, it is not aware that it's blind. And not only that, but it thinks it's more sighted than people who actually see. Now, in my past work, and then I'm going to get to how this current book is, is you know, it's sort of the um, whatever. It's just the complement and the amplification of what I've been writing about, but in, in really new directions. You know, so in my past work, I talk about how Watiko operates through the blind spots, through the unconscious, through the part of us that projects onto the ink plot in such a way that we actually hypnotize ourselves and we put ourselves under a spell. And that is actually the, that is our situation. That we as a species are collectively under a spell. It's like being in a fairy tale. And, but the thing which is so weird is that, and I imagine we've all experienced this on both sides, when we see somebody who's seemingly asleep and we try to shed light on their blindness, it can oftentimes just make things worse. You know, now the thing about Watiko, when I talk about this in the new book, when Watiko is present in, in the field, in the room, it's not safe to speak. That if you express yourself, if you express what your experience is, You'll get censored, you'll get deplatformed. And, and what happens, that's an externalization of an inner process because when that happens in our world, like it's happening in our world right now, that if somebody speaks truth and shines light on darkness, that's a dangerous situation. And that dynamic of having, of, of it not being safe to speak, becomes internalized in our psyche and gets 
pushed down into the unconscious so that it becomes chronic. And then we actually unconsciously shut ourselves down. Okay. And, um, you know, and then we've unwittingly offered ourselves to be this instrument for the mind virus. So one of the things in my work that I consistently talk about is the profound importance of being creative, of connecting with our creative nature. Because, okay, I mean, I can, I can write a book about that, but basically um, the best protection against Watiko is to be in touch with who we are, with our nature, with our true nature. But that can feel, you know, so many people talk about, oh, our true nature, and it becomes like this, you know, this meaningless, this, this cliche. But what is our nature? What do we mean when we talk about our true nature? And in my work, I talk about that our true nature is, by its nature, creative. So when we have the realization of our nature, we embody and express ourselves creatively. And... As we express and embody our creativity, the more we know our nature, okay? In a positive self-reinforcing feedback loop that creates light upon light. So the idea is, is that being creative is one way of describing what the medicine is for what ails our species. So in the book, in this new book, I have, there's a chapter, there's this, this philosopher um, Berdiev, Nicholas Berdiev. I'm not even sure I'm saying his name right because I've never heard it spoken, but that's what happens when you're just self-taught and you just read. And Anyways, so I think that's how you say his name. And he was super into the profound importance of being creative. But he makes a point. He says, when we're creative, we actually... By the act of being creative, we're offering ourselves as an instrument for God to incarnate through us. He says, if people, are, if they're just sort of, you know, in this passive state, oh, I'm going to wait for the Messiah, for the second coming, he goes, then they're only going to see the crucified face of Christ. You know, when Christ is symbolic of the self. But the idea is, is that by actually engaging our creative nature, we actually are participating in the second coming, in the, the incarnation of the higher self through our species. Okay. So in this book, I've been contemplating, you know, for a long time, because keep in mind, I'm not writing as an academic or a scholar or anything like that. I had a direct encounter with something that almost destroyed my life and it destroyed my whole family. I haven't had a family for over 20 years. I mean, I have a huge, you know, um, whatever, you know, friend group and soul family, but my family of origin, it was like the, in the Petri dish of my family, this pathogen this Watiko mind virus got in the Petri dish and it destroyed my entire family and in a way turned them against me in a certain way. And um, it, it almost drove me crazy. I mean, well, it actually did, I should be clear. Um, you know, just to be honest. And, um, but what I began to see, I was fortunate in that I, I didn't succumb. So what happened, and what I mean by that, without going into the story, I, I was the recipient of, of my father, and he just was you know, in the role of, he was not dealing with his stuff. And you know, as we all know, when we don't deal with our stuff, and we're parents, we just unthinkingly acted out on the next of kin. And I was the recipient, and like all of us, I was a sensitive kid. And there's a whole story. I, I won't go into it. But there were these episodes of this abuse, this emotional abuse, that kept on getting worse and worse. And then the worst time it ever happened 
Yeah, I was 22. It was unforgettable. I, the next morning I wake up, I had a fever for a year. There was nothing physically wrong with me. I went to hospitals and doctors. And um, at the end of that year, all of a sudden, then the fever went away. I, I, I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And then that entity that had taken over my father, because he was possessed by something, he was, he was not in his right self. It was like something had taken him over. Whatever that was, was now inside of my own mind. It took a year of that. It was like that was my mind-body's way of metabolizing the whatever had happened in that transgression, that energetic transgression. And so all of a sudden, I went from being a really happy, healthy kid who was very accomplished to not being able to live my life, just overwhelmed with suffering. And so I went inwards. I went deeply inwards. And, um, and after a couple of years of really just spending hours and hours a day just assuming the position of the witness, I had an awakening. I got hit by a bolt of lightning in my brain, not from the sky. And I was so ecstatic because I began to realize, oh my God, this is a collective dream. We're having a collective dream. We're all dreaming up into materialization, this universe, each and every moment. And I was so excited and ecstatic about what I was realizing that it, it kind, of, kind of freaked people out. And within the day, I got hospitalized and diagnosed and, oh, you're mentally ill and blah, blah, blah. I, I won't go into that. But the point is, I almost was destroyed by psychiatry, by the system of psychiatry. I could not believe what, you know, they didn't, they didn't recognize the awakening. They protected the, my father, the abuser. They pathologized me with an illness I didn't have. It almost destroyed me, but I began to recognize, wait a second, the same evil force that seemed to be sort of this higher dimensional force that had taken over and was coming through my father was now coming through the system of psychiatry. Okay. Then I began to recognize, wait a second, that's the same evil force that's playing out and informing and giving shape to the body politic of our world, like they were iterations of a fractal. So all of a sudden, I began to track this. I was seeing something, and it was like I was being shown something. And it almost killed me, but for whatever reason, I was able to have the understanding, wait a second, something is being revealed to me through this ordeal. And it took me a long time, like 12 years or something like that, of going to therapy and, you know, connecting with my dreams and making art and studying psychology and doing shamanism and plant medicine and alchemy and everything and anything under the sun because I was in such deep pain. And then I began to realize oh, wow, I'm synthesizing all of these traditions that have spoken to me in my own way. And that's when I began to teach and to start to write. And so I don't want to over-exaggerate this, but what Tico, this mind virus, there is, this is the most important thing in the world to, to actually see, to have understanding of. Because if we don't shed light on Watiko and really um, come to terms with it, there's nothing else that will matter. Because there won't be a species, a human species, okay? It's at the bottom of all of our destructiveness, self and other destructiveness, collective destructiveness, at the bottom, at the root of the source of all of the myriad world crises we're facing is Watiko. And I could spend the whole time just talking about how profound Watiko is. Um, you know, in, in the Castaneda books, Carlos's teacher calls Watiko, he doesn't have the name Watiko, he's talking about, but he's talking about Watiko. He calls it this predator or a number of different names. He says, this is the topic of topics. That's what I'm meaning. There is nothing more important than understanding what Watiko is revealing to us. Because 
it is revealing something to us that if we don't have the realization of what it's revealing us, it will kill us, okay? And yet, I point out in the book, I have a huge chapter on quantum physics. And I point out that, well, Tico, it's a quantum phenomena. And what I mean by that is that it, it's a superposition of states, the opposites are combined, just like is light a wave or a particle, which are completely opposite things. Well, is Watiko the source of the greatest evil? Or, and or, is it the source of, is it helping us to wake up? And the answer is, it's both. In potential, okay? And if we have the recognition of what Watiko is revealing to us, it actually catalyzes our evolution and expands our consciousness and opens our heart and unlocks our creativity. In the collected works, Jung, who, by the way, when I found his work, it was so helpful for me, because here I was in my mid-20s, and I was having a direct, unmediated encounter with evil, like I was describing through my father. And I'm not saying my father was evil at all. No, he was just an unwitting instrument. You know, because if I say, oh, he's evil, well, that's to conflate the personal with the transpersonal. That's a mistake. But the idea is, is that um, he was just playing a role in a deeper process. And getting back to, so in the collected works, Jung, who in my mind has the greatest understanding of evil I've ever come across, that was why when I found his work, like my head exploded because I'm like, oh my God, he's talking about what I'm encountering. And I didn't know anybody who was articulating it. He says, he says a number of things that I'll share. He says, um, he suggests that God has placed this special purpose in evil and that it's actually might be showing us something incredibly important for us to know. And he points out that People who say, oh, evil doesn't exist. And, and he's like me. He's talking as, as a, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a student of psychology. But he was talking not as this, this metaphysician or like, you know, like this spiritual evil. He was talking psychological evil. The evil that we ourselves enact every day in our lives whether it's with our addictions or our self-destructive behavior or our self-hatred or we act out our abuse. And the origin of all of those things are in the psyche. That's what he means by psychological evil, you know? And he talks about that it is a, this huge mistake to think that evil doesn't exist. On the contrary, he says evil is, it's striding across the world stage and we, have to deal with it. Now, the thing about Watiko, it's actually pointing at, one of the things it's teaching us is the profound importance of the psyche as far as a major factor in the creation of events in our world. And what, what Jung says, he goes, the problem of our time, the problem is that we don't understand what's happening in our world. And he says, what's happening is that the darkness of the soul, of the unconscious, is emerging, okay? And I point out in my work that unlike in the time of Christ, where the light is coming down from heaven, and that's, that's the form of the incarnation of the deity, that the deity is coming from the underworld, through matter, through the darkness, up into our world. And that's, that's the form of the incarnation of this higher um, energy, this godlike energy. And... Um,
you know, and this, this brings in one of the major, if not the biggest chapter in the whole book is about that we are all shamans in training. And, and I'll go into that a little bit, but, and it's funny, I, this particular chapter, I had written this literally the week before the lockdown. And what I was saying in the chapter is that we are going through this death rebirth experience in which we're descending into the underworld. You know, and that's the place of, you know, of, of, of madness, demons, of death. And I'm pointing out that we as a species, collectively and individually, are making this shamanic descent. And um, it incredibly helps when we see that because, you know, it's so easy to, to be feeling like you're going crazy in this world. Because this world, it, it, you know, from the looks of it and overwhelming evidence, we've, we're going mad. I mean, that's what Watiko is. Watiko is a collective madness, okay? Now, Young, what he says, he goes, in times of collective madness, he actually says this. He goes, there's only one thing that will save us. And that thing, this is a quote, is a new symbolic idea. Okay, now that's what Tico. Now, I also want to point out the one thing throughout history that these, whatever, these tyrants, these fascists or dictators or totalitarians, the one thing they're most afraid of is, is an idea whose time has come. Okay, and that's what Tico. So, what Tico is this quantum phenomena that contains both the deepest evil and it contains its own vaccine. But it's even more than that because it actually is catalyzing us, it's helping us to connect with our inheritance that's from the divine. Okay, and um, what I point out in the quantum physics chapter is that the actual solution and the healing for Watiko is offered to us by quantum physics. So I have a whole chapter about that and I'll just essentialize it right now. So before quantum physics came on the scene, there was, um, you know, just a pre-quantum physics, uh, classical physics, Newtonian physics, and those physicists thought they were studying this objective world that was separate from them, and they were just passively observing, trying to figure it out. I mean, they were passively observing in that they weren't affecting it. But then quantum physics came along into the world and into our minds, early 20th century, and the quantum physicists, the founding fathers, they realized, oh my God, the act of observing this universe is actually influencing the very universe we're observing, which is to say the act of observation is creative. Okay, this is the doorway, that's the rabbit hole. When you go into that, and that's what I go into in the quantum physics chapter, you actually discover this is a dream. This is not like it's, it's metaphorically a dream, this is nothing other than a collective dream that we have literally dreamed up into materialization and we have such genius creative power that's intrinsic to our nature that we become entranced by our actual conjuration, okay? And by saying the act of observation is creative, so how we interpret, like in quantum physics, how they interpreted the ink blot, the, the experiment, how they collected data, the questions they asked, that determined the answer they got, okay? So um, what this is pointing at, and this is what the whole book is about, because the, the whole idea, we're having a dream, what Tico is a dreamed up phenomena, okay? We are all dreaming up the madness, every single one of us is dreaming up the madness in our world with the whole whatever, fill in the blank. But what that means 
is that there is a possibility that encoded in that process of us dreaming up Watiko that we can have the realization that we ourselves are the dreamer and we can undream it. That's why that's the title of the book. Because when people ask me, because I point out we're committing collective suicide. I mean, that couldn't be more obvious. And people ask me, how come we're, we're doing that? And I can answer that. We're doing that. We are killing ourselves because we don't know how not to. Okay? And if we knew how not to, we wouldn't. The point is, is that hidden, encoded in the acting out of killing ourselves is the solution of how not to kill ourselves. That's the way we're teaching ourselves. And that's really, in a way, a symbol of Watiko. That unless we have the recognition of what it's showing us about who we are, about the profound importance of the psyche in creating our experience, about our creative nature, unless we realize that, we're fated to destroy ourselves. Because what I'm pointing out, and I point this out again and again and again, is that each one of us, you see what's happening in the world, part of it is that, oh, I feel so helpless and powerless, there's nothing I could do, oh, let me just be like an ostrich and turn a blind eye. Well, turning that blind eye, that is what you go, okay? But what I'm pointing out is that when you actually see the mind virus, the way it operates in the world, you see, it's an inner disease of the soul that actually somehow has a magical ability to extend itself out into the outer world and configure events and give shape to events so as to reflect and express the inner state of a psyche that's under the thrall of the mind virus. So it's so easy to feel helpless and powerless in our world, but what I'm pointing out is that we, each one of us, yeah, we're just one person and all that, but we have this unimaginably vast creative agency and power. And we're, we have it 24 seven, but because we don't know it, it's getting turned against us in a way that's killing us. Okay, so in the book, I, I, I really try to describe that, that process. And, and I bring in, you know, quantum physics. It's like, this is what quantum physics is about. It's actually revealing, it's showing us the dreamlike nature. But of course, the typical corporate academic scientist, physicist, they're not trained to recognize. You know, the big controversy is like, how do we interpret quantum physics? What does it mean? Like everybody, I don't know one person who doesn't study it and say, you know, all the physicists are saying, this is the most important discovery ever in all of human history in the realm of science. There's nothing even close. There's no argument about that, but it's what does it mean? And I'm, as a, I'm not a physicist at all, I'm just saying, no, it's showing us the dreamlike nature. And that's when you see the dreamlike nature, just like when you're in a night dream and you have the realization you're dreaming and you, you see through the imagination of existing as a separate self and you have the realization, oh, we're all dream characters in each other's dreams. We're interconnected, we're interdependent, we're not separate. What Tico is the separate self. You see, as soon as we see the world as objective, concurrently at that same moment, we then dream ourselves up to be a subject. And then we're a subject having a relationship to an object and they mutually reinforce each other. And that's what Tico. Then we dream up all the evidence confirming our, our deluded viewpoint of thinking the world is separate from us out there, objective, and we're separate. And, and the more we identify with the separate self, the more the world seems subjective, the more the world seems subjective, the more we identify with the separate self, it's a feedback loop. What I'm talking about is seeing through that feedback loop. Okay, so that's how quantum physics has offered the medicine for Watiko, and there's a huge chapter on quantum physics. Now, this other chapter um, I have is on um, synchronistic phenomena. And I think we all have experienced synchronicity. And um, in essence, without, because it's a very, I really unfold the whole synchronicity in, in, a, in a way that was satisfying to me. Um, 
what is synchronicity? Where all of a sudden a seemingly outer event reflects and expresses an inner condition of the psyche. So in other words, all of a sudden it's pointing out the connectedness between mind and matter. Okay. And when you realize the connectedness between mind and matter, which is what synchronicities are revealing to us, you see the dreamlike nature. Seeing the dreamlike nature is the very thing that actually dispels Watiko. Because you then discover, oh, being a dream character in each other's dreams, we are co-dreaming our experience. You see, that's what quantum physics is pointing at. We are literally creating our experience of ourselves and of the world each and every moment. But if we think we're not, then being like a dream, the universe will shape shift and reflect back, giving us all the evidence that we're not creating our world. And now we have confirmation of the truth of our viewpoint and we've hypnotized ourselves. That's what Tico. Okay. So I've been trying to point this out and keep in mind, I'm trying to point it out to myself too. Because I continually, you know, I watch myself fall asleep or get absorbed in the dream. Okay. So the origin, like I think in the very first chapter I talk about, you know, I was really trying to understand where did this Watiko, where did this mind virus come from? Because, you know, it's in, it's in the Bible. They talk about this mind blindness and that people have eyes but they don't see. And, and in the apocryphal text, they talk about Watiko precisely. They call it the counterfeiting spirit. But I point out that Watiko was on the editorial board of the Bible, so they made sure to edit, edit that out of the Bible because Watiko can't stand to be seen. When you see it, you take away its power and you empower yourself. So it does everything it can to try to stop someone from seeing it. Okay, so I point out you know, I think about, oh, okay, the origin of Wotiko, was it in like, you know, like negative ETs or a collective trauma that happened, or there are all these theories. And I have to say, like, more and more and more, I feel that the source of Wotiko is multi-generational, unhealed ancestral trauma. Like when somebody is traumatized, you know, and if they don't do their inner work and integrate it, what happens? then it will literally, unconsciously, they will enact their trauma, their unhealed abuse on the next of kin, like a psychic inheritance. And, and I go into that a lot in, in the chapter. And, you know, one of the things when I was studying the collective works of Jung, he talks about that evil gets transmitted over the generations. This is what he's pointing at. Okay, we are like regenerating evil each and every generation and it's up to us to really do our work and to really you know assimilate and integrate and it, not just the shadow and our unhealed abuse but in a way the archetypal shadow that we're all a part of and um because that that's the deeper process that's happening like i was saying before that we are being confronted with the darkness of ourselves you know, and um, so anyways, that's something I could say a lot more about it. Well, I guess one thing is that it's not, I point out that it's not just that light reveals darkness, but that light is revealed through the darkness. Okay, that's very Kabbalistic. In the Kabbalah, they talk about that the true light emerges out of the darkness. Okay, so on one hand, there's the, I'm thinking what, you know, the different chapters, there's the, um, the source of Watiko, the unhealed ancestral trauma. Then there's a, a big chapter on the major channel that Watiko works out is being in relationship, you know, and with your partner, with your friends. And it's, it's as if the deeper the love and the connection, the more the unhealed shadow plays out. And that can incredibly create misunderstanding and trauma and separation. But there is a way of, of carrying that, you know, when people trigger each other or acting out their abuse or fall unconscious or project, there is a way of, of actually adding light to that process and unfolding that, 
that can actually um, unlock, you know, uh, instead of it being poisonous and, um, you know, creating hurt and separation, it can actually even deepen your connection with the other person and with yourself. Okay. Um, so there's so much more to say. And, but I want to just talk a little bit about the, the chapter on shamanism because, like I said, that was the chapter I finished right before the lockdown. And, um, you know, no, I'm no shaman. I'm only a shaman in my, in my wildest dreams. I, I kind of joke with my friends. But um, the shamanic archetype got really activated in me because of my encounter with evil. All of a sudden, because of what happened with my father and with psychiatry, I had a big problem. And, um, and it had to do with what is up with this incredibly, this malevolent evil energy that seemed intent on, on, on killing me, on destroying me. And the closer I got to the light, the more fierce the darker powers came. And so, so the shamanic archetype w is really activated in me. And I point out that's one of the major, if not the major archetype that's activated in the collective unconscious of our species. And one of the things that I learned is that um, there are two dangers of shamanism. One is when somebody, you know, has a little understanding and they put out a shingle going, I'm a shaman and they have no idea of the powers and principalities they're dealing with and they can get destroyed or they can really hurt other people. The other danger is for us to be unconscious of our shamanic abilities. Okay, that creates poison. And I point out in the book, we are shamans in training, all of us. And, and just finally to complete my talk, just to give you a real sense, in essence, of the shamanic journey. And, um, you know, when I talk about this, so a shaman, think about it, we're whole, we all are in trauma, and when there's trauma, we get overwhelmed, we split, we, you know, part of us disassociates. And if we don't integrate that part, that part develops a seeming autonomy, an independent life of its own. In psychology speak, that's an autonomous complex, Indigenous people call that a demon. Okay, that's what he go. And um, the point is, we, we are all, like I've been saying, conjuring up the madness that is playing out in our world. It's not separate from any of us. It's reflecting back our own madness, our own darkness. And we've been made sick by it. You know, how can you not? The only way you're not going to be made sick is if you armor yourself from it and that's a form of sickness. So we've all been infected and, you know, um, yeah, by the collective madness that's playing out in our world, then we've all, in a certain sense, gotten kind of a bit, a bit mad, a bit sick, a bit out of sorts. What a shaman does, so once they dissociate, that constellates the journey for them to go in, in you know, in search of their law, of their, of the part of them, of the part of their soul that has gotten split, that has gotten lost, that's frozen back in time. And um, the idea is, what I'm trying to say is being shamans in training to the, like what a shaman does, they actually then take on the sickness of the person or the community they're working with and fall sick. And that occasion of falling sick that becomes the doorway through which they even more deepen their experience, finding their way back to their wholeness, to their center, to the self. And when they do that, instead of if they stay sick, if they stay stuck and identified, then they're going to need a shaman. And what I'm pointing at is that when a shaman does that, energetically, that clears the pathway for that person or the community that they're working with to then actually find their own way back to their wholeness because the shaman is energetically sort of modeling that. And we are that shaman. We are shamans in training. And with the madness and the evil that's playing out in our world, 
if because the shaman what is the shaman it's the storyteller it's the dreamer it's the creative artist that's the importance of creativity if we could turn that energy into creativity that sickness that's why for me if i didn't find my creative voice i would have been in deep trouble but then i found my creativity and that's been healing me that's the oxygen for my soul okay so um yeah i just want to thank you you know so much for coming and i could uh, you know obviously this is what i think about all the time i could go on and on but there are certain of these 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 linear time constraints um so i should probably stop but um yeah i just want to thank everyone so much so thank you Paul, yeah. give us a blessing. Give you a blessing? Yeah. Okay. Hong Guru Chen Yorji Nucheng Sam Pema, guess of Nampa La Yat and Chogi, no rebet Pema, Jung Nishi Sudra Kuru Karo, Mampa Kuchi, Chesu Daru Kitchen, Gil of your social soul, Guru Pema, Sidi Hong. Oma hung beza guru pema sidi hung among beza guru pema sidi hung oma hung beza guru pema sidi hung on benza sato samaya mano palaya benza sato teno patista drido meba wa suto kayo meba wa supo kayo meba wa anu rakto meba wa sarwa sidi maprayatsa sarwa karma susame sitam shayam kuru hung ha 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 ho bagawan sarwa tata gata benza mame munsa benza bawa Maha Samaya Sato Ah. Okay, thank you. So Q and A, right? That's what we're doing now. Um, anybody have a question? Yeah. Thanks for uh, a very provocative presentation. Um, I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on uh, free agency. I mean. Going back to Spinoza in the Western tradition, he pretty much dispelled the, the likelihood of free agency. The Bhagavad Gita, pretty much the discussion between Arjuna and Krishna dispels free agency. Isn't the real illusion free agency? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by free agency. Do you mean like uh, will, free will? Yeah, the fact that you as an agent have free will to operate in the world. Well, okay, no, I, I under, okay, I get it. So here's what I have to say about free will or free agency. Um, so, you know, it's a thing that a lot of people think they have free agency or free will when they're just acting out their unconscious and they're being puppeteered, you know, and yet their subjective experience is, oh, I'm doing something, I'm... When, when meanwhile they have no idea that they're taken over by their unconscious and they're just compulsively acting out. And I think there are a lot of people who are in that situation and can even identify themselves of, no, I'm, I have free will. And, you know, so that's not free agency or free will. I guess the point I want to make, and I just, I just defer to my teachers, you know, because I've been fortunate in my life having these incredible teachers, is that they say that when you have the realization of your nature, they say that's when you actualize free will. And the image they use, they say, it's like putting your hand up in the air. And they say, when you have realization, you can move it in whatever way you want. And, and that's the real free will. But unless you actually have that realization, whether you call it the Buddha nature, the true nature, the perfect nature, there are a zillion names for it. And that's pointing at the miracle nature of who we are. Unless we actually have that realization, then, you know, yeah, we can talk about free will all we want, but I don't think it's the real free will. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. Speak of the generational. What? What's that? So when you speak of all of Patika being generational. Yeah. It makes me think about, well, 
relatively new diagnosis, which is complex PTSD. Right. So I wonder if that inspires you to uh, recommend it treatment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I consider myself one of the world experts on trauma because I've been so traumatized. And, um, and I'm very aware of, you know, complex PTSD. And, you know, the thing which is interesting, trauma is very much having to do with Watiko. And, and then we'll get to, you know, the, the healing of it. Because think about it, we're in trauma, right? And what is the pathology of trauma? It's the compulsion to repeat. And that's the, that's the illness, that's the, that's the symptomology of it. So that when we're traumatized, the way we try to heal from our trauma actually creates more of the trauma we're trying to heal from. It's an infinitely self-generating feedback loop and we are the ones who are doing it. But encoded in our acting out of the trauma we're actually trying to kind of discharge something. Like one of my favorite definitions of trauma is unexperienced experience. Because at the moment of trauma, by definition, it's so overwhelming that we split and we can't express it, we can't integrate it, we can't, you know, in a symbolic way, articulate it. So we've never actually consciously experienced it. So that's the underlying sort of teleology or purpose of trauma is that it's, we're enacting it pathologically, but encoded in the acting out of it, we're actually trying to consciously experience it to have a corrective experience, okay? So as far as how to deal with that, I mean, my God, that's, I mean, that is like an incredible question because, you know, on the one hand, um, like I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about, you know, it's like our species is having this corrective experience, you know? And so what does it look like if collectively we're traumatized or individually, and if we were to have a corrective experience, what would that be like? What would that look like? So in other words, to experience, because we're, can, I see in myself, I'm continually, to the extent that I'm not awake, I'm unconsciously recreating my moment of trauma again and again, but then I see, oh, it's as if I'm wanting to experience it in a, in a new way, in a way that actually cuts the, the feedback loop, okay? And, okay, there's a couple of things. On the one hand, creativity is profound, but then I think in the collective works, Jung talks about this. He talks about how do we deal with, you know, when you have that issue or that problem and you always are thinking about it and it never goes away and the more you think about it, the more you have it. And he goes, the way to deal with that is find something that captures your imagination that's constructive, that's creative. And more, and this is what happened for me. I was like in this black hole of just re-traumatizing myself over and over after what happened with my father. And then when I found my work and my creativity, that was way more interesting to me than the trauma. And by more investing my attention, because we're sovereign beings and we get to choose how we invest our attention, by investing my attention on this creative, constructive project or, or on investing, in, investing our awareness in creating the world we want to live in, all of a sudden, what happens to our problems? What happens to our issues? they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Because in a sense, at least in part, they're a function of our awareness. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Uh, I, I just came back synchronistically from seeing a movie about Watiko. It's called Nefarious. Have you, have you seen the movie? No. Okay. It's about a, uh, an inmate home in prison, he's on death row, and he's got dissociative identity disorder, multiple personalities, and he's speaking to a psychiatrist about, he knows things that about the psychiatrist, he has a book that he put together about the psychiatrist, it's almost like he's a very powerful person. So the movie kind of describes or shows this 
inmate as a very powerful person, but it, the power is really in this demon that possesses this man who's right. committed all these murders. Right. And has now kind of got this psychiatrist in his grips. Right. Um, basically, it was hard to watch. You know, uh, it was kind of upsetting. Uh, I won't. I won't give away the story in case anybody wants to see it. But so, is there, is there a question? My question yeah. is: Is the is the power of the demon real? Because that's what it appeared to be in the movie. It was projected that way. That the pop, the demon was able to jump from the prisoner who was executed to the psychiatrist. Right. And it appeared very real. Tico, the way is this, you're yeah. going to talk about it, is really about our uh, finding this creative outlet and expressing our choice to yeah. move our consciousness to something else other than the focusing on the Wittico. Is Wittico real? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Is evil real? I can answer that, yeah. Um, at least from you know my opinion. I point out in my work that what Tico which remembers the source of the deepest evil in our universe has no independent intrinsic existence whatsoever from its side, right? And it can kill us. See, that's the paradox. And see, the thing about Watiko, it, so in the apocryphal text, it's called the counterfeiting spirit. So it, it actually impersonates us. And if we're not awake in that moment, and it'll present us with this limited version of who we are. Oh, I'm wounded, I'm traumatized. And if we then identify with its fictitious identity, this is what Jung was saying is one of the great dangers facing our species, is to identify with a fictitious identity. So Watiko offers us this limited identity. If we're not awake, we put it on, we identify with it, then it has us then it can manipulate us and control us, okay? And if you think about what I just described, Watiko can't steal our soul, but it tricks us into giving it away. That's number one. Number two, then we identify with who we're not, and we, and we forget who we are, and then we disconnect more creative power because Watiko has no creativity at all, but yet, it fools us and plugs into our creativity and turns it against us. That's what I'm pointing at. That when we see that, we can then re-own our own creative agency. And when we're in touch with our nature, like with the Buddha, and the Buddha, when he became enlightened under the Bodhi tree, right? There were the evil forces, the, the you know, whatever, the, the one, the evil one, Mara, and, and Buddha, saw Mara and, 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 and saw, oh, he's operating through my unconscious reactions, through my projections, you know, exactly like I'm describing Watiko. And so every time Mara would manifest from that point on, the Buddha would, would be completely unaffected to the point where Mara was like screaming and in anguish going, oh my God, the exalted one, his name for the Buddha, I have no power over him. He sees me. I can't. I'm powerless. See, that's what I'm pointing out, that Watiko, when we don't see it, it has power over us. But when we see it, the seeing of it dispels it. Just like when you bring in, in a dark room, and you open up the windows and the blinds, and the sunlight comes in, what happened to that darkness? It's gone, right? Now, when you're in that dark room, well, the darkness has an effect. You can't see, so it seems real. But then you let in the light. What happened to the darkness? What's that nature of the darkness? Okay, it's gone. It has no power at that point. That's what I'm pointing at. Okay, that's, the, that's why it's, it's so important to see Watiko, to see it, how it operates through the non-local field in our world, how it operates through our unconscious reactions and how it operates within our mind. And then when you see it, then you're all good in the sense that, yeah, you have to be mindful, but then you don't have to fascinate yourself over it. 
and you certainly don't have to avoid. You see people who are avoiding looking at it. Oh, I don't want to feed it because that makes it stronger if I look at it. They're avoiding relationship with themselves, which is what they go. Okay, but when you actually see how it works, then you discover, oh, I can actually invest my attention in creating the world I want to live in. And then when you do that, Watiko has no power. And then it dissolves as if it never existed. Okay, so that would be the way I'd answer that. Yeah. The role of fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, well, fear is superfood for Watiko because, you know, and think about what I was saying that when we identify with a separate self, that um, is Watiko. And when there's a separate self, there is an other. And when there is an other, there is fear. Okay? So, and that fear, that all of a sudden, we feel like, oh, you know, paralyzed, I can't move, um, you know, um, just the, even the word um, petrified, to be petrified is to be completely afraid, but it's also to be turned to stone, so you can't move, okay? So, fear is very much having to do with Watiko, but here's the thing. There are some of us, and sometimes I consider myself well, one of these people, who are trying to actually point at what's happening in our world and that it's this, this dangerous situation and people can hear what I'm saying and can feel really afraid. And, um, but that, it's sort of like with, with you know, when, when Paul Revere was coming, you know, on his horse saying the British are coming, the British are coming. Well, yeah, people were afraid when he said that, but it was mobilizing them instead of immobilizing them, you see? So that's the thing. We should be afraid in a certain way, not in the sense of, you know, getting hooked by fear and identifying with the fear, but fear can actually can activate us into action. And I think that's really, really important because if we just feel helpless and passive and just, oh, I'm just going to make the best of my life and my day with what's happening in the world, you know, as like sort of these evil totalitarian forces are taking over things, then we're just asleep, you know. So from that point of view, yeah, if, I, if me pointing out what's happening makes people afraid, well, that might be a good thing. But that's different than the fear from Watiko. Okay. Uh, yeah. One, question. Uh, one more question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit about um, the small facilitation <coughs> and how that's like about chemical training laboratory for the change? That sure. That? Sure. This is from a longtime friend who's been in these groups, you know, and um, right, right. I've outed, you know. Yeah, no, thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so I have these groups, and um, I've had them for close to 30 years. And, you know, there are a couple of them a week in Portland. A bunch of people here are from the groups. Um, and then I have a couple of groups international. And they're alchemical vessels in that we're together with no agenda. And over the course of time, our, un our unconscious plays out and we get triggered or, you know, you really get to know each other. And, um, and that's what we wait for. When somebody's inner process, they've been telling us about their process and all of a sudden it starts playing out in the room. And that's what we wait for. And we go into that in a way to try to metabolize it, to unlock the blessings that are hidden within it. And it can unlock the trauma of it. And, um, and it's basically about that there's a way of us being together, you know, as a group that can actually help us to wake up, or there's a way of being together that can actually just be keeping us asleep and re-traumatizing us. And, um, you know, one of the books that people are after me to write, after me to write a, a book about is about these groups. And, um, yeah, and there, you know, when I said I lost my family from Watiko, well, I've created these groups and they're like my family in that we become so connected through the heart and, and we play out our stuff and everybody, myself included, acts out our stuff and becomes vulnerable. 
but then we get reflection around that and um, you know and hopefully people will be able to take that in and it's a way of actually really accessing our, our blind spots our unconscious in a way that we could actually assimilate and integrate and work with yeah so anyways I'd like to thank everyone just so much really thank you <laughs>